Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And if you're sensing a different tone from me for today's episode, you're not wrong. What we're about to talk about today is one of the most sensitive areas in American politics, American law, and as it turns out, for American institutions. And I'll be talking on that last point a little bit more extensively. A number of you asked me to talk about the nature of the leak and the Supreme Court in general. That'll be towards the tail end of this video. I will time mark these in the description if you want to skip to that point in time. Before we get there, however, a number of you also asked me to talk about American jurisprudence on the topic of abortion what this leaked opinion actually says and does, if it were to become final. And so I'm going to talk to you all about that on the understanding that abortion in particular is one of those issues where reasonable minds can most assuredly differ. If we look at the very opening of Roe v. Wade from back in the 1970s, I think we've got a good starting point for actually having this discussion. The court says, we forthwith acknowledge our awareness of the sensitive and emotional nature of the abortion controversy, of the vigorous opposing views, even among physicians, and of the deep and seemingly absolute convictions that the subject inspires. One's philosophy, one's experiences, one's exposure to the raw edges of human existence, one's religious training, one's attitudes towards life and family and their values, and the moral standards one establishes and seeks to observe are all likely to influence and to color one's thinking and conclusions about abortion. No matter what anyone says, and I'll also be talking about this very briefly at the end of the video, the topics we're going to discuss today are not easy questions with easy answers. And the Supreme Court of the United States, as well as courts and legal authorities around the world, have wrestled with it for quite some time. With that as our understanding, I do want to talk about the jurisprudence here, how we got to what appears to be a draft position in the Dobbs case, and what it would mean going forward if the draft opinion were to be adopted as final law, with the understanding that that is not what actually happened. So let's take a look at these cases so that hopefully we all have a better understanding of what this road has been. We start with Roe versus Wade in 1973. Now, I already read you one of the introductory paragraphs for this particular case. There is a lot of that kind of language. The Supreme Court has always known that this is an area of some fraughtness to be discussed at the high court versus in the legislatures of the United States. And ultimately, one of the things we will see in the court decision that is still pending this year is the concept that the states might be a better venue with which to actually discuss this particular topic. If you aren't familiar with the way the United States government is operated, it has a constitution at the top. It has the federal legislature under that. It has the federal judiciary, which interprets whether what the federal legislature does is constitutional. And then under the federal government are 50 separate states with their own versions of quite often the same kind of structure. What Roe versus Wade did, as we will see, is effectively lay a blanket over what the states can do by saying that there's a federally observed right to an abortion in the U.S. Constitution. Once you get that right at the highest level of the land, the state's hands are tied somewhat. And so we'll be following that in Roe versus Wade. We'll be following that in the Casey case, and then ultimately in Dobbs to see how the court dealt with this very tricky proposition. So after some standing and other legal formulae in the top of the case, we get to the material merits analysis. The principal thrust of appellant's attack on the Texas statutes is that they improperly invade a right said to be possessed by the pregnant woman to choose to terminate her pregnancy. Appellant would discover this right in the concept of personal liberty embodied in the 14th Amendment's due process clause, or in personal, marital, familial, and sexual privacy said to be protected by the Bill of Rights or its penumbras. And this is one of those cases where you actually see references to penumbras and emanations from the Constitution. We will be talking about some of the criticism of the way Roe versus Wade is drafted, regardless of the way you find its policy positions, probably towards our discussion of Dobbs. But for right now, what we need to understand is the baseline for this 
is in this 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which says, among other things, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and privileges or immunities is not jurisprudence that is looked terribly fondly upon by the Supreme Court, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And this kind of notion of liberty, meaning something substantive that can be protected by this amendment, is where Roe versus Wade is ultimately going to find that right to privacy and that right to abortion. Liberty cannot be denied by a state without due process of law. And that's what's brought up before the court here. And ultimately, the court is going to find that that is in fact the case. Now, Roe versus Wade also has really long sojourns into history class, right? We've got a description of ancient attitudes towards abortion, the Hippocratic Oath, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This goes on for pages, and that kind of historical analysis is one of the reasons it sometimes uh, gets criticized in various uh, legal treatises and law schools, to be frank. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more as we proceed. The Constitution, says the court in Roe versus Wade, does not explicitly mention any right of privacy. That's acknowledged, right? That's not in there. But the way the Constitution of the federal government is set up is that it is a list of things the government can do. It is not a list of restrictions on the government. So the, the U.S. federal government and the various states that operate underneath it once the 14th Amendment is applied to them are only supposed to be able to do the things that the founders agreed to in the U.S. Constitution. And so you don't actually have to mention specific rights in most instances because everything that isn't mentioned that the government can do is either held by the states or held by the people. Now, unfortunately, the U.S. Constitution isn't terribly clear about whether it's held by the states or people on a number of these issues, and that creates some of the friction points that we see in a whole bunch of cases, not just this particular line. The court continues, in a line of decisions, however, the court has recognized that a right of personal privacy or a guarantee of certain areas or zones of privacy does exist under the Constitution. And then they cite a bunch of those cases. These decisions make it clear that only personal rights that can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty are included in this guarantee of personal privacy. Now, this sounds to you like the court's making some of this stuff up as it goes along. That's a problem in a whole bunch of lines of cases, especially when you start talking about substantive due process, the 14th Amendment, and things along those lines. But this is important precedent for when we talk about Dobbs, because you'll see them reference the other things that are based on this finding of a guarantee of privacy. They make it clear that the right has some extension to activities relating to marriage in Loving versus Virginia, procreation in Skinner versus Oklahoma, contraception in Eisenstadt versus Baird, family relationships in Prince versus Massachusetts, and child rearing and education in Pierce versus the Society of Sisters. This right of privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. So it's broad enough conceptually to find an abortion within those emanations and penumbras, says the court in this particular decision. On the basis of elements such as these, appellant and some amici argue that the woman's right is absolute and that she is entitled to terminate her pregnancy at whatever time, in whatever way, and for whatever reason she alone chooses. With this, we do not agree. And this is gonna be an important beat when we talk about Dobbs, because one of the things that's happening in Dobbs is if Roe versus Wade and Casey actually get overturned, it is possible, I would even argue that it's likely that some states of the United States would agree with the Pellant and Samamiki and give broader abortion rights uh, to some women seeking that service in the states themselves. We will get there, uh, but just keep that in mind that when Roe versus Wade is decided, a number of states want to uh, say no abortions at all. A number of states want to say abortions further than the court ultimately decides on in this particular decision. And that's going to come up again if what we saw leaked this week actually winds up getting finalized. The privacy right involved, therefore, says the Roe versus Wade court, cannot be said to be absolute. We therefore conclude that the right of personal privacy includes the abortion decision, but that this right is not unqualified and must be considered against important state interests in regulation. And then the court kind of crafts a tier structure that this can be evaluated on. Texas urges that apart from the 14th Amendment, life begins at conception and is present throughout pregnancy, and that therefore the state has a compelling interest in protecting that life from and after conception. 
The court says, we need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. When those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary, at this point in the development of man's knowledge, is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. And if you're really analyzing the law here, one of the problems with Roe versus Wade is even though the court says this, by putting a standard down of any kind, the court is kind of deciding somewhat of an answer here. And that has rubbed certain judiciaries, certain states, the wrong way for 50 plus years at this point in time. It should be sufficient to note briefly the wide divergence of thinking on this most sensitive and difficult question. There has always been strong support for the view that life does not begin until live birth. That's what the court follows that up with. So it says, we don't have to solve this. Texas thinks it begins at conception, but there's also a lot of folks that say it doesn't it begin until live birth, which is totally fair. We're way into reasonable minds can differ territory here. And I'm not the person, and this isn't the YouTube channel, to tell you how to feel on those particular issues, except to note that reasonable minds do have both of those positions uh, in the world. In view of all this, says the Roe versus Wade court, we do not agree that by adopting one theory of life, Texas may override the rights of the pregnant women that are at stake. We repeat, however, that the state does have an important and legitimate interest in preserving and protecting the health of the pregnant woman. These interests are separate and distinct. Each grows in substantiality as the woman approaches term, and at a point during pregnancy, each becomes compelling, right? So they are checking under a strict scrutiny test when the state in question has a compelling state interest to get involved says, with respect to the state's important and legitimate interest in the health of the mother, the compelling point in the light of the present medical knowledge is at approximately the end of the first trimester. Roe versus Wade will famously set up a trimester-based approach on what a state can and can't do based on the following. This is so because of the now established medical fact referred to above that until the end of the first trimester, mortality in abortion may be less than mortality in normal childbirth. So they make the statement here that effectively, because childbirth is more risky than abortion, the state doesn't have a compelling interest in it until at least the end of the first trimester. And that's interesting in and of itself. We'll actually see that this doesn't survive. This is bad law as we sit here in 2022, before we even talk about Dobbs, because Casey's going to change some of this. But that's interesting that the court makes this ruling because it is more regulatory in nature. They're setting up a tier structure and we will see Dobbs criticize that in a manner that I recall hearing in law school from not conservative professors, but very progressive professors that were talking about how Roe versus Wade was written. This is very, uh, activist is a bad word, right? When we're talking about the judiciary, but it's very active in actually setting forth what this right should look like by the court. It follows that from and after this point, a state may regulate the abortion procedure to the extent that the regulation reasonably relates to the preservation and protection of maternal health. With respect to the state's important and legitimate interest in potential life, the compelling point is at viability. This is so because the fetus then presumably has the capability of meaningful life outside the mother's womb. And this is going to survive, this kind of viability concept, even though that's something of a shifting line that the Casey court will acknowledge ultimately. So you've set up this tier structure that is going to be established where the state can do certain things at certain points in time and not until certain points in time have been reached. To summarize and to repeat, says the Roe versus Wade court, a state criminal abortion statute of the current Texas type that, that bans it, that accepts from criminality only a life-saving procedure on behalf of the mother without regard to pregnancy stage and without recognition of the other interest involved is violative of the due process clause of the 14th amendment. A, for the stage prior to approximately the end of the first trimester, the abortion decision and its effectuation must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's attending physician. State cannot get involved in the first trimester. B, for the stage subsequent to approximately the end of the first trimester, the state in promoting its interest in the health of the mother may, if it chooses, regulate the abortion procedure in ways that are reasonably related to maternal health. So you can do things to help the health of the mother. And C, for the stage subsequent to viability, whenever that might be, the state in promoting its interest in the potentiality of human life may, if it chooses, regulate and even proscribe, ban, abortion, except where it is necessary in appropriate medical judgment for the preservation of the life or health of the mother. So you got a trimester approach. The first trimester happens, then the state can regulate just kind of procedural stuff for the health of the mother. And then after whenever viability would be established, the Roe versus Wade court doesn't tell us, then the state can actually ban abortion, should it so choose, because the fetus 
the child, however you want to frame that particular entity, can survive outside the mother's womb. And that's what we had for approximately 20 years. That's Roe versus Wade. That's what's a threat of being overturned here. The important thing to note from at least one perspective in terms of the reporting here is that overturning Roe versus Wade would return the decision to the states. It doesn't ban abortions at a federal level. It's not that kind of decision. And that's one of the things that the Casey court in 1992 would struggle with. So I think we have to talk next about that Casey court. So here's Casey versus Planned Parenthood. And I got to tell you, nobody can read this thing. Even if you're in law school, this is a very difficult case to read. So we see here, the case is decided as follows. We just have to highlight this because we're going to talk about it in in overall terms. But it's Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy, and Justice Souter announced the judgment of the court and delivered the opinion of the court with respect to, so not everything we're about to read necessarily, parts one, two, three, 5A, 5C, and 6, an opinion with respect to part 5E, in which Justice Stevens joins, and an opinion with respect to parts 4, 5B, and 5D. This was a very, very divided court. And even what is read into the opinion here is effectively a plurality ruling in very important parts with different justices matching up for different sections so that you kind of have a precedent, but it's very, very rough. And unfortunately, the very first line of Casey is not a great one for that kind of judicial approach. Liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt. Now you tell me exactly how you put all of this stuff together with various justices all over the place, but it's a good line. Liberty does have a problem when you don't know what direction a case is gonna go. And spoilers, what Casey is ultimately going to decide is that the starry decisis of Roe versus Wade, the precedential effect of that court case is so strong and so many folks have relied upon it that the court should be very, very, very reluctant to overturn it. Obviously, whatever stare decisis Roe versus Wade and Casey had you know, years and years ago is stronger now when we're looking at the Dobbs court. So that signals, if it does get overturned at the end of the day, that this court in particular does not find that same precedential effect for Roe versus Wade and Casey. And I know a number of folks are upset at that decision. I don't blame them. It's really a a judgment decision on the part of the court and these various justices. We're going to talk about stare decisis as we look at this summary. After considering the fundamental constitutional questions resolved by Roe, principles of institutional integrity and the rule of stare decisis, we are led to conclude this, the essential holding of Roe v. Wade should be retained and once again reaffirmed. And that's a very interesting sentence because we're definitely going to be talking about it with respect to this leak and Dobbs in this video, right? The Roe versus Wade decision is so important and so fundamental and so many folks have relied upon it that to overturn it to the Casey court threatens the institutional integrity of the court that the court will be seen as a political body, and that is something to be strenuously avoided. And that is also happening right now, this week, today, because of this leak. We'll get there. It must be stated at the outset, says the Casey Court, and with clarity that Rose's essential holding, the holding we reaffirm, has three parts. So let's go over them again. First is a recognition of the right of the woman to choose to have an abortion before viability and to obtain it without undue interference from the state. Now, they're already rewriting Roe a little bit because we're going to see there's going to be an undue burden standard that Casey introduces. But suffice it to say, viability is still the line. Second is a confirmation of the state's power to restrict abortions after fetal viability. And third is the principle that the state has legitimate interests from the outset of the pregnancy in protecting the health of the woman and the life of the fetus that may become a child. And that's interesting in and of itself because the actual tier structure of Roe versus Wade had the first trimester as sacrosanct, completely inviolable to state regulation. And here, Casey's already tipping its hand by summarizing Roe in this particular fashion. They're saying, well, the state can actually make certain regulations early on, and those regulations can't be an undue burden. We'll get there. Uh, But they are recasting Roe a bit so that the court can get to its ultimate decision. This is not unusual for the Supreme Court. I'm not calling them out on this. Uh, It's just the kind of thing that definitely happens when you're summarizing the prior holding of a very important court case. It is tempting, says the Casey Court, as a means of curbing the discretion of federal judges to suppose that liberty encompasses no more than those rights already guaranteed to the individual against federal interference by the express provisions of the first eight amendments to the Constitution, right? Those amendments, the Bill of Rights, say Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. 
But the constitutional structure is not limited to what is called out in that Bill of Rights. This, the Casey Court, the Roe Court, a whole bunch of courts have gotten exactly correct. There are rights reserved to the states and there are rights reserved to the people. Or as the Casey Court says here, of course, this court has never accepted that view. It is a promise of the Constitution that there is a realm of personal liberty which the government may not answer. We have vindicated this principle before. Then there's some quotes here. It is a rational continuum, which broadly speaking includes a freedom from all substantial arbitrary impositions and purposeless restraints, and which also recognizes what a reasonable and sensitive judgment must that certain interests require particularly careful scrutiny of the state needs asserted to justify their abridgment. And I love reading old Supreme Court cases for exactly that kind of language, but suffice it to say what that really says is, hey, we have to look pretty carefully when the state decides to regulate something because liberty is a very important American value when we're looking at these various documents. Casey Court continues, the inescapable fact is that adjudication of substantive due process, that's the 14th Amendment that we talked about with respect to Roe versus Wade, may call upon the court in interpreting the Constitution to exercise that same capacity, which by tradition courts always have exercised, reasoned judgment. And that's telling you that the court is going to be putting together some rules. It's going to be doing some things that are more active. We're going to use the word active here than perhaps other courts would be willing to do. Men and women of good conscience can disagree, says the Casey Court. And this is very important. That's reasonable minds can differ written in Supreme Court form. And we suppose some always shall disagree about the profound moral and spiritual implications of terminating a pregnancy, even in its earliest stage. Some of us as individuals find abortion offensive to our most basic principles of morality, but that cannot control our decision, says the court. Our obligation is to define the liberty of all, not to mandate our own moral code. The underlying constitutional issue is whether the state can resolve these philosophic questions in such a definitive way that a woman lacks all choice in the matter, except perhaps in those rare circumstances in which the pregnancy is itself a danger to her own life or health. And... That's a good paragraph. I think it's an important paragraph, especially for what the Casey Court is going to do. It's also a slightly incorrect paragraph, right? We, of course, value liberty very, very highly. But when we talk about crimes that can otherwise be permitted or otherwise be regulated against uh, by the state, there is, of course, a version of a moral code that is being enacted to restrict liberty in an important way. And the Dobbs Court is going to talk about that in at least the draft opinion a little bit. And I want to set you up for that because they are going to criticize Casey on that particular point. And again, I think everything that you hear, see at the top of this paragraph where good conscience can disagree, absolutely right. And then the question becomes, is that the kind of thing that the federal court should ban, should allow, should mandate? And, and that's where we get into reasoned discussion about what American jurisprudence really should be. Continuing on with this particular decision, we see the, the reference to stare decisis. And this is ultimately what the Casey court is going to decide upon. Even when the decision to overrule a prior case is not, as in the rare latter instance, virtually foreordained, it is common wisdom that the rule of stare decisis is not an inexorable command. And certainly it is not such in every constitutional case. Stare decisis is more what Pirates of the Caribbean might call guidelines over rules. That if there is a tremendous injustice, the court is not bound by the actions of a prior court. And in fact, certain modern courts have corrected massive injustices that prior Supreme Courts had engaged in. So the first thing the Casey Court acknowledges is that the stare decisis concept can, of course, result in overruling a prior court. They talk about Lochner in terms of economic due process. They talk about Plessy versus Fer Ferguson. They talk about times that the Supreme Court has asked to do this. It says, but to do this here would be simply to refuse to face the fact that for two decades of economic and social developments, people have organized intimate relationships and made choices that define their views of themselves and their places in society in reliance on the availability of abortion. It said another way, people are getting together out there on the streets because they know that abortion is available and they're making decisions based upon that. And that's reliance on a kind of societal level. We will see this critiqued by Justice Alito in his draft against Casey, which is one of the reasons I highlighted here. But overall, that's the concept behind why stare decisis is so important in this case to the Casey court. They say, look, people have relied upon this. There's also a whole section here that talks about how the Supreme Court itself could be considered a political actor if they just moved against it. 
While we think Plessy, for example, was wrong the day it was decided, we must also recognize that the Plessy court's explanation for its decision was so clearly at odds with the facts apparent to the court in 1954 that the decision to re-examine Plessy was on this ground alone not only justified, but required, which is an interesting uh, statement to make, that sometimes overturning a decision that's so clearly unjust is required by a court acting in good conscience when the facts look so darn different from six decades later. Uh, and so that's about segregation in schools. If you aren't familiar with that particular line of cases, the court said first that it was fine and then re-looked at it and said, no, no, that's definitely not fine. And they overturned their prior decision, even though there were reliance interests, et cetera. So Casey is explaining why this doesn't rise to that level. A decision to overrule, overrule Roe's essential holding under the existing circumstances would address error, if error there was, at the cost of both profound and unnecessary damage to the court's legitimacy and to the nation's commitment to the rule of law. Now, here's where I differ with the Casey court. This is opinion I'm, I'm editorializing here, uh, but obviously Casey, reasonable mind, can differ with me on this. I don't believe that trying to defend kind of the political institutional value of the Supreme Court is worthy of not correcting an injustice. If you saw one, the Casey court really doesn't analyze Roe versus Wade in the fashion that you would expect. They're not analyzing whether or not it's a just decision. They kind of have a whole section here that basically says it needs to stand because of reliance. It needs to stand because it would be seen as too political and it would jeopardize the Supreme Court stature and feelings of the people towards it. And I think that's the wrong reason. I have absolutely no problem with the Casey court going in and saying, well, Roe versus Wade is still good law. We don't have a problem with it. But this kind of decision rings to me of what we see so often from the Roberts court. We're going to make a choice here to try to make it a little bit less effective. We're going to kick things away from the court because of standing. And you've heard me in virtual legality complain about that uh, pretty frequently. So this kind of reasoning I don't love, but it is the reasoning that the Casey court used. So we highlight it here. Then we get section four, which I highlighted in red, just to point out, we don't quite have the same majority for this, and that's kind of background. And then remember section five, we're actually gonna be talking about the rules, is agreed to by three of them, and then five of them sometimes, and a different five in other times, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna look at the summary here. We give this summary of what we just decided. To protect the central right recognized by Roe versus Wade, while at the same time accommodating the state's profound interest in potential life, we will employ the undue burden analysis as explained in this opinion, which has been explained and re-explained and re-examined in a bunch of cases since Casey. But suffice to say, it's essentially the state can't do something that imposes more costs than benefits sometimes, or maybe is just a burden that isn't rational that the court might determine. Suffice it to say, it's a difficult, somewhat vague standard to put before the court but it is a new rule. They're changing what Roe versus Wade decided. An undue burden exists and therefore a provision of law is invalid if its purpose or effect is to place a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before the fetus attains viability. And as you can probably guess, if you've been in virtual legality for a while, substantial obstacle is in the eye of the beholder, is in the eye of the justice or the judge in many, many ways. And, and so this has been something that's been adjudicated a lot since Casey was put forth as law. We reject the rigid trimester framework of Roe versus Wade. And regardless of whether exceptions are made for particular circumstances, a state may not prohibit any woman from making the ultimate decision to terminate her pregnancy before viability. So we get through Casey and Casey basically says, trimesters are out. Uh, we've got viability. That might change in terms of the number of weeks uh, where we're actually looking at viability by the time 1992 hits. It might be different by the time 2022 hits. We don't know uh, exactly what a court might do with this. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a similar framework using a different judicial rule, undue burden instead of strict scrutiny, and all sorts of stuff that we probably don't need to bother ourselves with for the analysis that we're going to do on this new opinion. And that's where things lay in large respect. Now, we get to Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, which I have labeled as 22X because it's not actually a decision of 2022 just yet. Also, if you've been with me in virtual legality for a while, you know I flagged Dobbs earlier when I did a video called Shadows in the Docket that discussed the Texas bill, Senate Bill Number 8, and how it was proceeding past the emergency review section of the Supreme Court and making everybody, including myself in that video, a little uneasy with how personnel were being deputized and when you could challenge a law. And I flagged at the end of that case that people were probably looking in the wrong direction 
for what would be more likely to be a significant opinion, which was, of course, even as early as May of 2021, pretty obviously going to be Dobbs, which leads us to the Politico headline, Supreme Court has voted to overturn abortion rights, draft opinion shows. And there's nothing really wrong with that headline. It is at least slated in the draft opinion, which I've got about 10 pages or so that I'm going to look at with you. Uh, It is overturning the federal concept of abortion rights, but I do think some folks on Twitter and social media are getting wrong the specifics of what it does. A lot of people ask me about what it does for the states, what exactly is happening here. So we're going to talk about it. Let's look at this draft. The first thing to note is that this is a draft circulated February 10th, 2022. That's a couple of months ago, even now. And when you're drafting an opinion like this, this is to ensure that the five people that voted in favor of one direction or another at the initial conference that they would have had after oral arguments are all on board with the explanation that the person that was chosen to draft here is actually giving. And there'll be a little bit of infighting or revisions made. There'll be comments based on the dissents that are going to come out. They kind of respond to each other. That's how you get footnotes that respond to other parts of the documents. And then you release them all at once. You release the opinion, you release any concurrences, you release any dissents, and it comes out as something that you can actually analyze as a part of law. That isn't happening here. And the fact that it's a version that is almost certainly not the most current version of this opinion is part of the story as well. I'm going to be talking about a little bit more when we get to talking about the leak and why the concept of the leak bothers me as much as it does. But we can dive in to what everybody has been diving in on. So this is a Justice Alito opinion. It is not law. That's the very first thing that you have to note. It is a draft opinion. It has not been officially released by the Supreme Court of the United States, but it does say, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. That provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. The right to abortion does not fall within this category. So we know, just based on that paragraph, that Roe and Casey are being overruled and that the reason they're being overruled, effectively, is that finding something within that right of privacy requires certain things that the current court, five votes on, are saying were not achieved by the concept of abortion. As Alito continues, Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Its reasoning was exceptionally weak, and the decision has had damaging consequences. And far from bringing about a national settlement of the abortion issue, Roe and Casey have inflamed debate and deepened division. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. The permissibility of abortion and the limitations upon it are to be resolved like most important questions in our democracy, by citizens trying to persuade one another and then voting. And this is actually a Casey dissent from Justice Scalia. That is what the Constitution and the rule of law demand. So this particular decision, in broad strokes, before we get into any of the other pages, is saying it should be returned to the states, where the people and their legislatures can decide on what is actually going to be an acceptable framework for regulating, not regulating, banning, not banning, or whatever else they want to do within that state's boundaries in respect of the process of abortion. As I said, when we were discussing Roe versus Wade and Casey, that's very likely, in my opinion, to result in more availability of abortion in a number of states, because even at the time of Roe versus Wade, you saw states saying we should be allowed to have abortions up till, realistically, birth, right? And you had that same court saying, hey, a lot of folks think that in in these particular cases, there isn't a human life until there is a live birth. So you get back to the concepts that the Federalist Papers or the Founders might say is the laboratories of democracy concept, which I understand is the kind of thing that some folks are going to find uncomfortable when they think that it's giving away liberty, rights of, in this case, pregnant women. And that's a reasonable position to take. Uh, This position is the opposite, saying that the states are a better body to look at this particular issue than the federal government, primarily because, again, in the U.S. constitutional infrastructure, the federal government isn't given any general rights, where the states, 
through the Constitution are given a lot of reserve rights. They are given, for instance, the right of general welfare, the police power, we tend to call it, where they can make decisions, for instance, about abortions and also about vaccines. And we've seen that, obviously, in practice in the last couple of years. That is what would happen here. You're not looking at a federal ban on abortions if this opinion were to become the law of the land. Now, they continue... We granted certiori to resolve the question whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. Petitioner's primary defense of the Mississippi Gestational Age Act is that Roe and Casey were wrongly decided and that the act is constitutional because it satisfies rational basis review. So they deliberately passed these laws knowing that they violated Casey and said, let's go up to the Supreme Court. Respondents answered that allowing Mississippi to ban pre-viability abortions would be no different than overruling Casey and Roe entirely. They tell us that no half measures are available. We must either reaffirm or overrule Roe and Casey. So here, Justice Alito is effectively saying, look, here's what was argued to us. And the side that is against Mississippi said, you can't go with them because that would be to overrule Casey and Roe entirely. And so we did that. Now, obviously, it doesn't take a genius to say what Mississippi is asking for is actually a pre-viability ban. It's a, I believe it's 15 weeks. Uh, so they're asking for a reduction in viability by nine weeks or so. I think it's at 24 by general understanding right this second. And Alito is saying, well, if you're telling me that I have to overrule the entire structure, then I guess we'll overrule the entire structure when someone might otherwise reasonably expect, and honestly, this is what I expected when I looked at the case, that the court might otherwise say 15 weeks is now okay, but that the overall structure uh, remains. I think that's what people are likely most surprised about with respect to this decision. And don't be entirely surprised if what the ultimate law of the land is, is that Rowan and Casey survive at that 15-week level. We're going to talk when we talk about the leak about some of the reasons why I think it might have happened and why it's not so easy to put on one political party or side or the other. Continuing, we're going to get into some criticisms of the Roe and Casey regime, because remember, Justice Alito has to say, hey, why doesn't stare decisis block me here? Instead of seriously pressing the argument that the abortion right itself has deep roots, supporters of Roe and Casey contend that the abortion right is an integral part of a broader entrenched right. Roe termed this a right to privacy, and Casey described it as the freedom to make intimate and personal choices that are central to personal dignity and autonomy. Casey elaborated, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. The court did not claim that this broadly framed right is absolute, and no such claim would be plausible. While individuals are certainly free to think and to say what they wish about existence, meaning, and the universe, they are not always free to act in accordance with those thoughts. License to act on the basis of such beliefs may correspond to one of the many understandings of liberty, but it is certainly not ordered liberty. And what does Justice Alito mean by ordered liberty? Ordered liberty sets limits and defines the boundary between competing interests. Roe and Casey each struck a particular balance between the interests of a woman who wants an abortion and the interests of what they termed potential life. But the people of the various states may evaluate those interests differently. In some states, voters may believe that the abortion right should be more, even more extensive than the right that Roe and Casey recognized. Voters in other states may wish to impose tight restrictions based on their belief that abortion destroys an unborn human being. Our nation's historical understanding of ordered liberty does not prevent the people's elected representatives from deciding how abortion should be regulated. And here's where you'll get fights from reasonable minds, right? That we don't want the government regulating what should be an unalienable right. If abortion is that, then all of this paragraph is gobbledygook. If it's not, then the states have certain interests in actually regulating these various things. And one of the trickiest parts about abortion, of course, is that even though the Roe v. Wade court tells you we don't have to decide when life begins, in some respects, you kind of do. Because if life begins at conception, then you have competing liberty interests that the courts are actually trying to decide. And that's what Alito says here. If it isn't that, then you don't have those competing interests and liberty is easily found for the pregnant woman. It's why it's one of those diabolical, philosophical, religious, and of course, legal questions where reasonable minds truly can differ. Alito continues with Roe was also egregiously wrong and deeply damaging. For reasons already explained, Roe's constitutional analysis was far outside the bounds of any reasonable interpretation of the various constitutional provisions to which it vaguely pointed. Roe was on a collision course with the Constitution from the day it was decided, and Casey perpetuated its errors. And the errors do not concern some arcane corner of the law of little importance to the American people, rather wielding nothing but raw judicial power, says Justice Alito, quoting Justice White, the court usurped the power to address a question of profound moral and social importance that the Constitution unequivocally 
leaves for the people. And again, this is strong language. It's a draft opinion. I would have to disagree with Justice Alito that the Constitution unequivocally does anything on abortion. I think you can definitely argue what Justice Alito is arguing here, that it's in that reservation of powers uh, for the states. However, if you instead found that it is in the reservation of powers for the people, then you don't get to where Justice Alito gets at all. And to be frank, the Constitution does a really poor job of delineating between which powers it's reserving for the states and which powers it's reserving for the individuals, the people in question. So I disagree with that conceptually, but you can see now how Justice Alito is getting to where he gets here in the Dobbs opinion. The weaknesses in Roe's reasoning are well known. Without any grounding in the constitutional text, history, or precedent, it imposed on the entire country a detailed set of rules much like those that one might expect to find in a statute or regulation. Dividing pregnancy into three trimesters, the court imposed special rules for each, and we already talked about those from the Roe versus Wade perspective. They then discussed Casey a little bit above this, replacing that trimester framework with an undue burden test. And ultimately what Justice Alito is going to say here, and I didn't bring all 98 pages of this opinion, so as to keep this video within some kind of time frame that we all can accept, is that those are basically the court making policy and regulatory decisions that they are ill-equipped to make. And to some extent, I do agree with that framework. In my old law school days, my constitutional law professor used to call the court the Nazgul because they would sit up there with nine robed figures, unelected for any purpose, and do bad things to the country. Regardless of what position you were in, the court was going to do some bad thing to whatever political process you otherwise wanted to protect. And so... In law school, it was drilled into me that the legislative branch, the legislature, those representatives elected by the people are where policy belongs. And the court getting involved is always going to be problematic. So at some philosophical level, I do agree with the concept that a court going about and making these particular tranches and doing these various things looks a lot like policymaking that is better left in the hands of the legislature. Could that be the federal legislature? That's an open question that we'll see with this Dobbs decision because we're not actually seeing a framework that describes the federal uh, system can't do this thing more than it doesn't do this thing and the constitution doesn't just grant this right. So one open question is, can the federal Congress actually put together a statute that would do what Roe and Casey did or at least something like them and would that be upheld in court? It would certainly get sued over, I can promise you that. But it's not as obvious a question as it might first appear. Obviously, there's also the ability of the various states and of the people to amend the Constitution. If you have a truly egregious Supreme Court decision that the people just roundly reject, then they can get together and their state legislatures can get together and you can amend the Constitution. We haven't had an amendment in a good long time. Obviously, that's more difficult than going and persuading five people on the court. And so I am very understanding of really all the sides discussing this on my timeline and elsewhere on social media and getting outraged that five people in those robes could decide to do something like this. Alito continues with an important note, I think, which is the viability line, which Casey termed Rose central rule, makes no sense. And it is telling that other countries almost uniformly eschew such a line. Footnote 51. And footnote 51 says, according to the Center for Reproductive Rights, only the United States and the Netherlands use viability as a gestational limit on the availability of abortion on request. The court thus asserted raw judicial power to impose as a matter of constitutional law, highest law of the land, a uniform viability rule that allowed the states less freedom to regulate abortion than the majority of Western democracies enjoy. And that's part of the story as well. You go look at European countries. If you look at their various abortion rules, many, 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 many of them have abortion that is banned, prohibited, or otherwise allowed to be well before that viability line, which again, I believe is 24 weeks right now in American jurisprudence. So 15 weeks from Dobbs, which again was what I was expecting the court to actually adopt, is roughly in line with the Frances of the world and would be expected. Uh, The 24 weeks is out of line a little bit with what other countries have said, not to suggest that other countries should denote what American rights are, but it is worthwhile to note, as Alito does in his decision here. Then we get into that reliance argument, right? Casey doesn't actually establish direct reliance. They do that kind of societal reliance thing, and Alito takes offense. Unable to show concrete reliance on Roe and Casey themselves, the Solicitor General suggests that overruling those decisions would threaten the court's precedents, holding that the Due Process Clause protects other rights. And here we get into the meat of things. People DM'd me this all the past 36 to 48 hours, which is we talked about Roe versus Wade. We talked about Casey versus Planned Parenthood. We talked about the right of privacy. 
how it comes out of those penumbras and emanations that the 14th Amendment kind of adopts into the Constitution. And one of the things that jumped out at people was, okay, if you overturn Roe and Casey because abortion doesn't appear as a word in the Constitution and it's not an existent right, doesn't that mean the Supreme Court could attack uh, procreation laws, could attack interracial marriage laws, could attack contraception laws. And I don't think that's wrongheaded to say, okay, if they're doing that, what can't they do? And here Alito promises that they are not doing that. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any problem with somebody looking at this and saying, I, I, don't, I don't believe you. I think that's a fair stance to take. But this does bind, politically at least, the voters for this particular decision somewhat. Right? There would be a political cost to just flipping on this in the near future. And what do they say on this? They say, that is not correct for reasons we have already discussed. As even the Casey plurality recognized, abortion is a unique act because it terminates life or potential life. And to ensure that our decision is not misunderstood or mischaracterized, mission most definitely not accomplished, we emphasize that our decision concerns the constitutional right to abortion and no other right. Nothing in this opinion should be understood to cast doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion. Like I said, a reasoned mind can look at the Dobbs decision as proposed, it's not law yet, and say, hmm, doesn't that put a whole lot of other quote unquote rights up for grabs? And I would agree with them. But this decision at least proposes to get in front of that particular complaint by saying, we view abortion as unique, no other right. All, and all this other stuff, marital intimacy, the concept of marriage, procreation, child rearing, none of this actually results in the destruction of life. And so that's a unique act and the court takes it as separate from this entire other line of cases. And they reference uh, Oberfelge, Hodges, Griswold, Lawrence v. Texas, all these other things that you might be hearing on your social media streams, your Facebook posts, your Twitters, your Instagrams, whatever it might be. Understand that at least as currently presented, the Dobbs decision does anticipate that and says, no, we're not hitting anything other than abortion. If you don't believe them, I don't really blame you, uh, but they are at least committing to that politically if this were to be included in the final decision. Neither decision, they note, has any debate over the issue of a constitutional right to obtain an abortion. This is Roe v. Casey again. Indeed, in this case, 26 states expressly ask us to overrule Roe v. Casey and to return the issue of abortion to the people and their elected representatives. This court's inability to end debate on the issue should not have been surprising. This court cannot bring about the permanent resolution of a rancorous national controversy simply by dictating a settlement and telling the people to move on. And I think that's a real politic kind of statement, but it is accurate. You can't have these kinds of divisive issues solved by Nazgul sitting on high and telling everybody how it's going to be. And I think that's ultimately the main issue with Roe v. Wade and its line of cases. However you might feel about the substance, we end this opinion where we began, abortion presents a profound moral question. The Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey arrogated that authority. We now overrule those decisions and return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. The judgment of the Fifth Circuit is reversed and the case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. It is so ordered. So hopefully, going through those summary highlights of this proposed Dobbs decision, which remember isn't final and is very unlikely to be final. It could be substantively the same. It could have most of the same high points that we just discussed, but it is very likely to be altered in some significant ways as well, that they're overturning Roe and Casey primarily because they find that the analysis that included them in this right of privacy was an error. I skipped whole large sections where Alito goes in on American history and establishing that it couldn't possibly be uh, adopted when the Constitution was adopted, couldn't possibly be adopted when the 14th Amendment was adopted. You can go and check those out uh, on your own. Uh, they're just big history lessons, and you can agree or disagree with where Alito comes out. Obviously, if you disagree on that, you're going to wind up back in Roe and Casey land, uh, and that would be justified if you do disagree on the historical lessons uh, that he puts forth there. That's why it gets overturned, though. And overturning doesn't ban abortion. In fact, as Alito said, and I think he's right, it is very likely to be broadened uh, in some states as well as narrowed in others. Uh, and that's where things are obviously very divisive, very controversial opinion would be a very big deal. Overturning precedent from 50 plus years ago uh, and a reaffirmation in the early 90s. And that's why everybody cares about it. But now we have to talk about what's happened this week. And that is, of course, the leak. Uh, 
Uh, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to make this video, to be frank, a lot of people asked me about it, asked why I was tweeting about it. And ultimately, the, the leak is an issue to me because we're at a crossroads in American history. And, and you might have heard this from me in other videos in virtual legality, uh, but I am uh, I'm a lawyer, right? I'm trained in the law. I'm trained in the civics of the United States, in the judicial branch, the executive branch, the legislative branch. And, and I believe pretty strongly uh, that this system in America ha has worked pretty well uh, since its founding in terms of keeping civilization and society functioning in a relatively good way. And unfortunately, I I've seen that be really, really challenged in important ways in the last little bit of my lifetime here. Uh, and, and this is another kind of addition to that particular problem. And so you see, a, you see a leak like this. The Supreme Court is supposed to be the least political of our bodies. And someone inside the Supreme Court leaked this out, right? As Politico says here, they, they point out two things. One, they point out deliberations on controversial cases have in the past been fluid. Justices can and sometimes do change their votes as draft opinions circulate, right? If somebody writes a concurrence that actually you agree with more than what was proposed to be the majority opinion, you change your vote over to that concurrence. And if enough things do that and there's enough wrangling, then the concurrence suddenly becomes the opinion of the court. That has 100% historically happened and it might well happen in this particular instance, but that's one of the reasons the leak is so damning to me. The immediate impact of the ruling as drafted in February would be to end a half century guarantee of federal constitutional protection of abortion rights and allow each state to decide whether to restrict or ban abortion and no draft decision in the modern history of the court has been disclosed publicly while a case was still pending. But Politico isn't done. Politico also has more sourcing. A person familiar with the court's deliberations, probably the source for the draft opinion, said that four of the other Republican appointed justices Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett had voted with Alito in the conference held among the justices after hearing oral arguments in December, and that lineup remains unchanged as of this week. So it's Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Notably, if you're keeping track of the justices at home, I don't know why, but if you are, you'll note that Chief Justice Roberts is not on that list. And we get Politico saying how Chief Justice John Roberts will ultimately vote and whether he will join an already written opinion or draft his own is unclear. And that cuts to the heart of this thing, right? We're looking at why this might be leaked and it goes against every bit of Supreme Court precedence. You want them to not be politically minded. You want them to be reading the constitution and the laws outside of public pressure. That's how the structure of American government was set up. That's what the Federalist Papers tell us. That's implicit in the way that we have done this for as long as the American experiment has been viable. And this goes to the very heart of that because it's very difficult to see this particular leak as anything but trying to influence the court, which when Chief Justice Roberts actually acknowledges, he says himself. So on May 3rd, 2022, yesterday, he acknowledges that this leak is legitimate. Yesterday, a news organization published a copy of a draft opinion in a pending case. Justices circulate draft opinions internally as a routine and essential part of the court's confidential deliberative work. Although the document described in yesterday's reports is authentic, it does not represent a decision by the court or the final position of any member on the issues in the case. Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr. provided the following statement. To the extent this betrayal of the confidences of the court was intended to undermine the integrity of our operations, it will not succeed. The work of the court will not be affected in any way. We at the court are blessed to have a workforce, permanent employees and law clerks alike, intensely loyal to the institution and dedicated to the rule of law, evidently with some leaks. Court employees have an exemplary and important tradition of respecting the confidentiality of the judicial process and upholding the trust of the court. This was a singular and egregious breach of that trust that is an affront to the court and the community of public servants who work here. Remember, remember in that Casey decision when they said that basically Roe has to stand regardless of anything else. We're not even going to analyze it because of the importance of the integrity of the court. I have directed the marshal of the court to launch an investigation into the source of leak as it's never happened before. I don't know how effective the marshal of the court is going to be at establishing that. But what's important about that is one, it's acknowledged as real. And two, it's acknowledged by Roberts himself as implicating the politics of the court, which might be why it was leaked in the first place, right? I tweeted this out. This is why so many people contacted me. I said, I'm having trouble thinking of any time that a leak of this nature has ever happened this suggests a massive breach of trust security at SCOTUS. This was before Chief Justice had actually answered. With as many questions raised as the draft decision itself. Who did this? Why? What is the purpose? And the only purpose that really makes a lot of sense 
is to undermine that negotiation process, to undermine the court in some fundamental way, to get people to go in certain directions. And, and I don't think that's limited to party. And I don't think it's limited to just conservatives who are gung-ho about this, being angry at liberals for leaking it. I don't think any of it is that obvious, even though I tweeted this as I saw the news that same night within an hour. Obviously, this position that there's the leak is very, very important seems to have been taken up primarily by Republicans and, and very loud conservatives in various sectors. I really don't think it should be on those party lines. And I think I have a pretty good case for saying that I don't do that, right? I, I have a problem with the institutions of the United States being attacked on all sides, right? I had this video, which a number of people continue to comment on and DM me about, called This Is Not The Fall, about January 6th, talking about what that meant to me, what we were looking at, how important the American institution is to me, telling folks uh, that this wasn't the end and to talk about how things could be better from then on. This to me is the same kind of concept, right? This leak impugns the court, uh, much like the electoral process was impugned uh, by some of the activities uh, at, the, at the changing of the guard, the changing of the presidency. Now, I think, as I said, it's not a party line vote, right? The Roberts office actually wound up leaking further to CNN that same night. Roberts does not want to completely overturn Roe versus Wade, CNN reports, meaning he apparently would be dissenting from Alito's draft opinion, actually concurring with it. Likely with the court's three liberals, sources tell CNN, Roberts is willing, however, to uphold MS law, banning abortion at 15 weeks, CNN has learned. So half of that is wrong. Uh, tweet reporting is often very wrong. I'm not really trying to hold CNN's feet to the fire on this, but it sounds like Roberts wants to go in the direction that I anticipated the court to go in, period, which was the Casey decision of viability is coming down a little bit to that 15 week mark that the Dobbs court would otherwise propose. And I thought that made sense for what we knew about the politics at the court level. Uh, and Robert seemingly is trying to push people in that direction. And I said here, it looks to me like that makes Roberts the most likely source of the leak. I'm not even sure of that at this point, because just looking at it from a party line perspective, right? Everybody thinks that it's a liberal clerk or justice or whatever that leaks it out in order to expose the evil conservative Republicans. But the tendency of this leak is to lock in whatever the five folks that voted for it actually voted for, right? Because the one thing the Supreme Court doesn't want to do is look like they are kowtowing to political pressure. And it might be that a Republican side clerk or justice or what have you wound up leaking it because they were afraid that somebody was going to go with Roberts. It could also be Roberts that's trying to use political pressure to say, hey, look at this Alito decision. You really want to be a signatory to this? Look at how people are reacting. So basically, all sides of this equation, one could imagine a justification for leaking, and all of those are bad for the institutional integrity of the court, right? When we talk about these things, that's why it's bad. And that's why my final tweet on this which again, people took offense to because they say I'm ignoring the substance of the decision. I'm, I'm really not trying to. I don't feel it's my place to tell you how to feel about the nature of life and abortion and all these various things. So I try to explain them without telling you how to feel about them. And so I tweeted out, however you might feel about the decision, the substance, and it's not for me to tell you, the leak itself is a continuing slide away from democratic norms and ever closer to a certain ends justify the means barbarism of which all should be wary. Right, you hear me quote Man for All Seasons all the time, but you should be cautious about sweeping down all the laws for whatever your means might demand because it doesn't take much for whatever empowered entity, institution, government, or otherwise you've made to turn that all around on you. And some right-thinking people came and commented and said, hey, well, look, uh, the Republicans and conservatives stole two members of uh, the judiciary and this kind of leak is just a response to that. And to that I say, I understand that position. I am even sympathetic to how certain of those seats were seated and how that all went down. However, however you feel about all of this, it is undeniable that certain seemingly inviolate norms, like not leaking opinions from the Supreme Court, not charging the White House, not doing even what was done with those seats are slowly dissolving. And my point on that is that that dissolution is likely to be ultimately more harmful than any one given data point because it's on society's institutions, on the rule of law, that we ultimately have our rights protected. Uh, and that's what I mean by that. So if you're offended by that, that I wanna talk about the leak, that I wanna talk about what it means, I sincerely apologize because I don't mean to offend on any of those grounds. Hopefully the rest of this video was educational and informative to you. Uh, 
but I do think it's important to discuss. And, and on that point, I do want to flag, since this is a video game channel, I did see this tweet from Bungie. A lot of people flagged it for me, uh, saying, standing up for reproductive choice and liberty is not a difficult decision to make, and, and explaining that they are going to uh, back uh, abortion providers, ask people to donate to them totally within their corporate rights, uh, and that's totally fine. But I do disagree with this sentiment that I highlighted, right? I didn't do an hour-long video. Roe versus Wade doesn't start with an entire discussion of understanding that reasonable people can disagree with this decision and how this is such a deeply philosophical and religious issue to have people that make wizard shooting games tell you it's not a difficult decision. So I feel pretty adamant about that, which isn't to say you can't agree with Bungie. In fact, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends do, and Bungie is well within its rights to do that. I just wouldn't have framed it as an easy, an easy call, uh, because even the Supreme Court, our highest judicial thinkers, religious philosophical thinkers, don't really think that any of this is a terribly easy call. This has been Virtual Legality for today. Thank you for joining me for it for its entire runtime. This is, of course, a Virtual Legality Extra. If you enjoy these types of conversations, uh, don't expect them very often in this space. We're primarily talking about business and legal issues through the lens of pop culture, video games, technology, and more. If you like those, do consider supporting the channel at Utreon or Patreon, telling folks that we're having these discussions, otherwise engaging with the video content. If you did catch this as a YouTube video, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.